one live all right hey everybody thanks for being here we're trying out a new technology today so hopefully you'll like it and you can hear us and see us everyone's Let's there see. no it's showing zero what do you mean we got messages no didn't say anything yet hope i'm doing this on my right page so 1601 yeah 1601 is four o'clock yeah but so look this number has to change Oh, 18. There we go. Oh, cute shirt. Sharon said cute shirt. Very good. Sharon's All right. There. Sorry, guys. Have a new perspective. So, hi. I've been gone for three weeks. I missed you guys. Got a new t-shirt. My Eat Your Damn Kale shirt has uh, gotten too big for me. Wow. All these comments appear right there. That's so cool. So, welcome to episode 45 of Weight Loss Wednesday. We've been doing this almost a year now. I'm Chef AJ, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And this is where we answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. The best way to submit a question, as always, is through my website, www.eatunprocessed.com. So before I get on with the questions, just to tell you where I'm going to be in the next few weeks in case you'd like to come see me live. I just got back from an amazing eight days at Rancho La Puerta in Tecate, Mexico. Please put that on your bucket list and perhaps you'll join me next year when I make a return engagement. They use me as both a chef to teach us hands-on cooking and as a speaker. And I will be there May 5th through 12th. So start saving now. And it, it's really amazing. I think you guys would love it. This Sunday, October 1st, I will be speaking at noon at the San Francisco Veg Fest. That's at Golden Gate Park Information I'm not sure the website, but if you just Google World Veg World Vegetarian Day or San Francisco Veg Fest, you'll find it. So that'll be this Sunday, October 1st at 1 o'clock. And on October 17th, which is a Tuesday, I'll be speaking for, I think, the ninth or 10th year in a row at the Best of Nature Cooking School in Redondo Beach, California. I'll be giving my brand new PowerPoint presentation called Chef AJ's Ten Commandments for Overcoming Your Weight Loss Obstacles. It will be live streamed, however, it will not be archived. So if you don't come live or watch it live, you won't be able to see it. And it's free, but you have to sign up on the website southbaychurch.net. So then next in November, the Remedy Conference in Hilton Head, South Carolina, remedyfood.org. I'll be with Dr. Doug Lyle and many other wonderful speakers. I hope to see you at an event very soon. we got a lot of events going on. Yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? Kenny yeah. was in Vegas. If, if you haven't met him, he, he might pop his head in. Yes. And uh, let's see, anything else I need to tell you I guys? just want to say, I do this Weight Loss Wednesday with AJ sometimes. And I don't know exactly what it brings. And AJ's always asked me the question, are we doing, should we keep doing this or well, not? It's just, I feel like we're just talking, I mean, I, I guess you guys are really there and watching. But and with all the con conference I had and people and the conversations I had on the side, it was fantastic to hear what we bring to the table. And I'm, again, I know we might change the time as it gets darker right, now. it's going to get darker. But I think I, I'm convincing her to keep this going and keep this going. And, and, yeah. and I hope I can help contribute a little bit. Now that I know some of you people from right. around the country, Jenny's online and she's on, her mom's online too. I Latrell. did miss you guys for the last two oh weeks. And I, gosh, I missed yes. the chance of wishing those of you who observed the high holidays a happy, healthy new year. I know that we have, uh, we just had Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur's coming up. So happy holidays on uh, that count. So I did miss everybody. That's that, that is true. So I, I think I'm out of, I, I'm out of practice, Kenny, cause I haven't done this in a couple oh, of weeks. Oh, come on. But, you got this down. But, but you can, what's kind of nice about this new system we're using is Kenny, isn't it easier to read the questions? It's yes. a little bit bigger I just get because closer. we're not doing it through the iPhone. We're doing it through the Mac and hopefully the sound will be to your liking. So without further ado, the first question comes from Jenny Leah in Australia. And Jenny, if you're watching, Down under. Somebody had just posted a question on my Facebook page asking about pressure cooking in Australia. They say they can't get the Instant Pot there. I'm going to talk to the company and find out why not. But you say you bought an electric pressure cooker. And would you be able to please tell me what the name and the brand is or post it on my Facebook page? Because somebody literally just asked this right before oh the broadcast. Gosh. So her question is that she wants to know, am I right assuming that the weight of vegetables to eat for breakfast and throughout the day is the weight after cooking? I am only weighing the breakfast veggies to get a rough idea of how I'm going. Obviously, salads are raw, but I like cooked veg for breakfast. She also wants to know if anyone from Australia watches Weight Loss Wednesday or is a member of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. I well, know. I can't tell you who's watching from Australia, but I can tell you we have quite a few people. I posted it the other day, a lot of people from 
place is called Tassie, T-A-S-S-I-E. So yes, we do have a lot of members from Australia. As a matter of fact, one of them actually came to the Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Vegas. So we definitely do. And we'd welcome you if you came. And so I personally, when I talk about weight, calories per pound, or I'm doing before cooking. So it's really not that big of a deal because it, at least in the terms of vegetables and even things like potatoes, the calorie density doesn't change that drastically from cooking to non-cooking. Now, beans and grains, because you cook them with water, they absorb water. They, it's a huge calorie difference. So when we talk about grains being 500 calories per pound and legumes being 600 calories per pound, that is weight after cooking. But with things like starchy vegetables, like potatoes, sweet potatoes, winter squashes that are 400 calories per pound, those are very close whether they're cooked or not. Fruit is about two to three. Most people don't cook fruit. I know now with the air fryer, a lot of people are cooking fruits like plantains and figs, but in general, we generally don't cook our fruit. So that calorie density stays about the same. Cooking does take the water out. But with vegetables, they are approximately 67 to 125 calories per pound when eaten raw. And they're about 200 calories per pound when eaten cooked because what cooking does is it takes the water out. It's such a negligible difference and vegetables are the healthiest food you can eat, both in terms of disease prevention, especially things like cancer and Alzheimer's, but also just in pure nutrition. They're the foods in the highest nutrient density, lowest calorie density that I really don't care if you're eating them raw or cooked unless, of course, you have certain digestive things going on where it's better for you to eat them cooked. That happens with some people. In general, the less a food is cooked or processed, the better it is for weight loss. But if you're just eating raw salads and raw kale, you're gonna be eating all day. I always do my weight before cooking. That's how I personally am calculating it. And, you know, Sharon McRae, if she's watching, is she watching Kenny? She gets mad, she says, you shouldn't tell people how much you eat. And I never did, I never, I don't weigh and measure my food, but people kept asking. That's how I figured out that I actually eat eight to 10 pounds of food a day. And the only reason I know how many vegetables I eat in, in terms of weight is because I am lazy and I buy all my vegetables in organic bags from Costco. And for example, the broccoli comes in three pound bags organic and it lasts about two days and the zucchini in four pounds and it lasts about two days. So that's kind of how I know because I know how often I have to go shopping. So my weight, when I talk about it, is weight before cooking. When you cook it, the weight is going to decrease because you've cooked the water out of it, okay? Any questions on that, Kenny, before Sharon's here, so she's here. She's on it. We have another question about vegetables, and this comes from, well, Kelly is the last name, so I apologize. Miss Kelly. Well, it's uh, her email. It's come from the Kellys. It's from the Kelly family. She goes, are carrots a non-starchy vegetable when raw, but, a, but are they a starchy vegetable when cooked? No. So I made a big mistake when I did my first lecture, The Secret to Ultimate Weight Loss in 2014, and it is recorded in your program when you buy it. Carrots are not a starchy vegetable. The only starchy vegetables that I know of, and you could Google this if you want more, are things like the winter squashes, delicata, kabocha, acorn, hubbard, butternut squash, potatoes, sweet potatoes. These are starchy vegetables. Uh, parsnips happen to be a starchy vegetable. Plantains are actually a starchy fruit. So carrots are a non-starchy vegetable, as are beets. When they're cooked, again, the caloric density increases a little bit because the water's been cooking out. They do become sweeter when they're cooked and more palatable to many people, but they don't change from being a non-starchy vegetable to a starchy vegetable just because of cooking. You do slightly change the caloric density. And believe it or not, you know, I know some people think, well, if you cook your food, you're going to obliterate all the nutrients, and it's not true. The truth is, is there's certain micronutrients that actually become more bioavailable. I think I'm not in the center. I want to move over. When lightly cooked. So, for example, the the carotenoid in carrots actually become more bioavailable like they do in sweet potatoes when they're cooked. The lutein in greens like spinach become more bioavailable when cooked and the which the lycopene in tomatoes actually. So there's nothing wrong with cooking your vegetables. The truth is it's easier to get in larger volumes when you cook it. That said, I still like people to eat a salad the size of their head every day and that takes into account that kids have smaller heads, they don't need to eat quite big as big salads. What we're doing in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program right now, the 30-day challenge is called the Salad Days of September, where every day we're eating at least one huge ass salad the size of our head and posting the picture. So thank you, the Kellys, for the question. So Elise wants to know, is carob powder a healthy replacement for chocolate? Well, <laughs> what would, you know, I always, you know, you know, like I've those, had it. I don't like it. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of a weak substitute. It really is. You know, I always think of 
WWJD, JD, what would Jesus do? I think about have a date. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And have a date with Kenny because he's single. I think about, well, you know, I have to tell you, as you've been trying to set me up for so long, I've been, um, I asked someone out, uh, so I asked someone, would they like to have a date? And you know what they said? No, they prefer no. figs. Yeah. <laughs> no, they said it's too sweet. Oh, yeah. ha, ha, very cute. Yeah. So I always think about WWDGD, what would Dr. Goldhammer do? And I can tell you what he said, because it, he, he denies saying this, but he really did. And he said, when a gentleman asked him this question, he said, carrot is a gateway drug to the use of chocolate. So the thing is, is I look at things as good, better, best. And if you are addicted to chocolate, which it has a calorie density of 2,500 calories per pound, and we generally eat it in a manner that is more calorically dense with high fat dairy or sugar, and this could help you get off chocolate, maybe it's okay. But the thing is, is how are you eating it? So for example, if you're telling me that you're sprinkling carob powder, oh, thanks, Kenny. He's, he's giving me like carob powder on your steamed kale to eat more steamed kale, I would say that's a great thing. But most people just don't eat carob powder by itself or cocoa powder by itself. Generally, we're using these things to make a dessert, usually a hyper palatable dessert, either with sugar, flour, and oil, or with high calorically dense foods like nuts and dates. So I don't think it's necessarily better than chocolate. I mean, it might be for the addictive properties because chocolate is highly addictive to most people that can't stop eating it, and it's, it's often tops the list as the number one crave food in the world. It has a bunch of chemicals, it's got caffeine. So from that standpoint, you could argue that it's healthier, especially raw. What carob is is a Mediterranean pod. It does taste more like chocolate when it's been roasted. So is it a healthy substitute for chocolate? I don't know. Is, you know, is light beer a healthy substitute for vodka? It really just depends on what your goals are and how you're using it. So if you, if I was Dr. Goldhammer, and sometimes I am because I have a Dr. Goldhammer mask that I often wear, and if you haven't seen my parody, please make sure you see my parody of me doing that. I would say no, but like I said, if it's gonna help you not eat a pound bag of M&Ms, then maybe yes. So there's this is sort of a gray area. I don't know, I'd have to know you more personally, but I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a harmful food the way that animal products or dairy or sugar or flour are. But again, if you're somebody that needs to lose weight, my guess is you're using carob as a chocolate substitute, so it's a dessert substitute, and that's not necessarily gonna help you facilitate weight loss, okay? Any more questions on that subject? Uh, I uh, not really. We're talking about sprinkling dark chocolate cherries. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, what I what I suggest to people is like, if you really have to have a chocolate hit, and you absolutely can't go chocolate free, is to go to bemanpaz.com, www.bemanpaz.com. A N D P A S dot com. There's 10% discount with my name, Chef AJ, no spaces. And she has an amazing dark chocolate balsamic vinegar. It's about, I think, 27 calories per tablespoon. Take that, put it over some berries, maybe, and that's probably a good way to get a chocolate hit without having a high fat, high calorie food. You know, I find the chocolate's really addictive. The last time I had it was Sunday, November 7th, 2010. And it was probably, I, I can't, I don't really don't know if chocolate or peanut butter was the harder of the two addictions for me to stop. I mean, sugar, of course, was, but I wasn't eating chocolate without sugar. A peanut butter, I think I was eating without sugar. That was really hard. I, has to, I had to ask for help from the divine to take away my desire for it. It was really, really hard. But in my case, chocolate was giving me migraines and my insurance wasn't going to pay for the max salt anymore this pill that was really expensive that, and i just i just realized that i was an addict and i needed to stop it and it was hard it was really hard because i was having chocolate every day multiple times a day so so i totally get it you want to know who's online yeah. jp is online no you know jp is coming to la that's my partner in the ultimate weight loss program and the ultimate weight loss mastery program personal trainer to the stars, 30 years nutrition uh, experience in fitness and nutrition. And if you live in Los Angeles, you should have a private session with him because he's rarely here. And if you don't live in Los Angeles, you can still have a session with him and he'll do it on the phone or through one of these technologies that we have now. 
We have a new person joining the WL, and it's a guy. A guy. Welcome. More guys. Well, you know what? Um, I was doing my PowerPoint presentation at Rancho La Puerta, and it gets bigger and bigger because as people have success, we've had over probably 2,000 people go through the program now and are losing weight and getting both the health and the body they deserve. They send me their before and afters. And if you're in the live ultimate, if you're in the ultimate weight loss program, you see these photos every Tuesday on our page. They're called Transformation Tuesday. And there just happened to be no male photos. And this gentleman in the audience said, why don't you have any guys? And it wasn't planned. I said, well, because no guy has sent me their picture. And since then, lots of you guys have. So thank you. We're going to be added to my PowerPoint. So Elise has another question. This is about salad. She says she doesn't like dressing in salad. Well, you're lucky in a way because a lot of people struggle to find a dressing that they like. I, again, recommend Beemon Paz Vinegar. Grapefruit is my favorite. Or my barefoot salad dressing is my favorite when I'm not traveling because that does need refrigeration. She says she loves putting fruit or rice in salad and love it. And I do too. I actually put both fruit and rice or fruit and a grain like quinoa and millet in my salad. That's how you make a satisfying salad using my eight secrets to superior salad satisfaction. And grain and fruit are amazing. And you're right, when you have grain and fruit in a salad, you really don't necessarily even need dressing. She says she's lost 10 pounds so far. Congratulations, has 10 pounds to go. And she goes, how much fruit is too much? So too much for what? So, you know, I've interviewed people like Robbie Barbero, the mindful diabetic, who's a type 1 diabetic, and he eats probably 80% of his calories from fruit. He is a raw food, low-fat raw food vegan, and it works for him. To my knowledge, he's never been overweight and probably never a food addict. But for some of us that have suffered with especially sugar addiction, fruit becomes our new sugar. And often we turn that processed sugar addiction first to the dried fruits, like the dates. And then when we finally get off the dates, then we go crazy with the fruit. Now, you are not going to get unhealthy from eating too much fruit. I, I, and you're probably, you're not going to gain weight either. But the problem is with the addictive quality of foods and having that calm, stable brain that is what we're really going after in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, the weight is the side effect of the discordant eating and the food addiction. Fruit can be a trigger for some people. And when I say a trigger, it just causes us to overeat. So in other words, I don't limit fruit, but I don't eat it every day either. It just, it really depends. And again, now fruits vary by the way. So when you say how much fruit is too much, well, you know, an avocado is a fruit and it's 750 calories per pound. And if you're somebody with heart disease or trying to lose weight, well, maybe any avocado would be too much, right? And then we have other fruits like the non-starchy vegetables. These are actually fruits, but we usually, usually use them in salads or savory vegetables. Things like zucchini, okra, bell pepper, tomato, eggplant, and cucumber, these are 67 calories per pound. These are botanically fruits. I don't think anyone could ever overeat on those, right? So then we have a wide variety of fruits in between from the fruits that are lower in the glycemic index, like the berries and the apples, and fruits that are higher on the glycemic index, like things like perhaps figs. I'm not really sure, maybe bananas. Bananas are higher in caloric density than the low glycemic fruits. And I see a lot of people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program kind of go crazy with bananas and eat, you know, five bananas in a sitting. And while that may not cause them any arterial damage, it might be too much fruit in one sitting because, you know, fruit does raise your blood sugar. Well, if it's in its whole food form, it, it, it's, it's much better than obviously if you're having fruit juice or dried fruit when you have the fiber and water intact. But if it raises your blood sugar quickly, it can raise your insulin more quickly, which drives fat into the cells. But in some people, it can also raise their triglycerides. And that's why Dr. McDougall in his book, the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss, talks about for weight loss, he recommends no more than, I believe it's two fruits a day. I don't think it's three, it's two. And so if fruit is helping you eat your salad, eating lots of vegetables, or fruit, like for instance, some unsweetened canned pineapple or fresh pineapple added to steamed kale makes it delicious. So I think if fruit is helping you to eat more vegetables and more salads, then eat more fruit. But I think what happens is too many people rely on fruit to satisfy their sweet tooth since they can't have or don't or choose not to have sugar anymore. And they can, they can overdo it at the expense of eating vegetables or starch, which is really what's going to satiate you. I, I do believe that the secret to slim and Janine at, at Potato Wisdom has this great t-shirt that says the secret to slim is veggies and starch. And I think it's probably a better way to go about it if you're somebody that has struggled with sugar addiction. I know myself, 
I'm not going to gain weight from eating too much fruit and either are you unless it's avocado, but I will go crazy with fruit because I, it's very hard for me to resist it, especially in the summer when the sugar kiss melon is in season. I buy one with the intention of eating a slice or a quarter or a half or three quarters, I end up eating the whole melon. Now it's not affecting my weight, but I don't like that feeling of being out of control and fruit does that to me. And so, you know, I find that bananas are almost too sweet for me now. So what I do is I freeze them. And last night I taught a cooking class, a hands-on instant pot cooking class, and we serve banana ice cream for dessert. Did I have it? Yes. But I think if you're having banana ice cream or fruit sorbet every day, multiple times a day, you might want to look at the totality of your diet and concentrate more on the starch and the vegetables because the starch is what's going to satiate you. The ultimate weight loss program is a starch based program, at least in terms of calories, at least three fourths of your calories need to come from starch. In terms of volume, yes, you're going to have large volumes of vegetables. So, so I don't know the answer for you how much fruit is too much. That's why I kind of go with Dr. McDougall's recommendation: two pieces a day for most people. That's a pound, you know, and that 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 should be enough for most people. That said, we have a lot of people that are food addicts, emotional eaters that aren't willing to work on the emotional aspect of this disease. And if eating a whole cantaloupe or a whole watermelon or a whole pineapple is going to keep you from going through Krispy Kreme's donuts, then do it. There's there's nothing unhealthy about fruit. Uh, so knock yourself out to the degree to which you're getting the results you want. You know, I always say this, and people don't believe that I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. Whatever your health and weight loss goals are, do the least restrictive program that you can do that will get you the results you want, okay? So thanks. Anything before I go? Well, we had a question about yeah. should they refrigerate balsamic vinegar, but but um, Sharon already told them no. Nope. No, you don't have to. Absolutely, you do not have to refrigerate it. Nope. Now, now, um, Elise has a third question, and that is, uh, well, it's not really a question; it's a statement. She says, "My overweight sister worries that I am anorexic, which I am not. Only on a health quest." Well, the operative word is overweight, and. We've talked about this in previous episodes, and I was being bashed. And by the way, I am not anorexic. I promise you, I've been this weight, 117 pounds for about five years now, easily maintained it, plus or minus three, depending if I'm traveling or not. And I eat a lot of food. If you look at episode 36, you'll see I eat at least 10, uh, excuse me, eight pounds of food every day. And I was anorexic in my teens, so I know that I'm not now because I don't have the symptoms of anorexia that I had then, which was when my hair all fell out, my nails fell out, my liver became enlarged. And so it's sort of offensive when you call people that name when it's a medical diagnosis. And unless you're a medical doctor, um, I think it's kind of offensive to body shame people, whether they are too heavy or too lean. But so that was happening to me by, by notable people in the plant-based movement. And I remember... Uh, immediately talking to Dr. Lyle, Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. McDougall saying, am I too thin? And, um, you know, it's funny because Dr. McDougall wrote me back right away with the Walter Kempner's weight chart and said, no, you could probably lose a couple pounds. And uh, Dr. Goldhammer said that it, it, the person that is calling, a, I mean, yes, there are people that are truly anorexic, obviously, but, but in general, the person that is calling somebody too thin is never as thin as them. And so it's either a jealousy thing or a perceived loss of status thing. Uh, I've never had a male tell me I was too thin. I've never had anybody that is my weight or leaner tell me I was too thin. It is always people and many of them watch this show and they comment right on the page how terrible I look and how they could snap me with a tri twig. And you know, you don't have to watch this show. It's not court ordered. If you don't like me or my appearance, if it offends you, don't watch, you know, change the channel. And, uh, so I wouldn't take I wouldn't uh, I would take it with a grain of salt free salt that your overweight sister is telling you that because she probably feels jealous because she is overweight and maybe she doesn't want to be. And now if you lose weight and she stays the same, you have she has lost status in your eyes. So anyway, thank you for that question. Anything before I go on? Someone saw you at the Dallas uh, Forks of a Knife event. They said, nope, you're not anorexic. Thank you saw you. your salad bowl. You know, I, I appreciate that because here's the other thing, guys, is one of the things is, and I was interviewing the lovely Dr. Pam Popper today, and we were talking about this a little bit offline, is that people have become so overweight in our world and in the country, something like 75% of the population, that we've lost the ability to recognize somebody that is of normal weight because it is so rare, especially if you live in certain parts of the world. I live in Los Angeles, and so I not only am don't I look too thin, I'm certainly not the thinnest person there. When I go to my yoga class, my spin class, 
there's probably at least 10 people that are thinner than me. We are the heart of the entertainment industry, Hollywood, where some actresses, models may actually be anorexic, but they're forced to be an unnaturally thin weight just so that they can work in their profession. But the thing is, is we develop our worldview of what is normal by what we see around us. And if three out of every four people we see are overweight or obese, when we do see somebody of normal weight, instead of thinking that they are normal weight, we are going to think of them as too thin. And as Dr. Goldhammer said, that nowadays, I mean, 98% of people that lose weight gain it back within two years. And so if somebody was previously heavy and is now thin, the only explanation people can come up with if they're not a heroin addict is that they're either anorexic or undergoing you know, chemotherapy. That's because it's so rare. You know, Dr. Goldhammer, who spoke at the Ultimate Weight Loss Live conference, said you would you would it would be easier for you to overcome stage four cancer than it would obesity or food addiction. So I can understand when people feel that way. Also, if you take somebody like Mary McDougal, who is at least 10 or 15 pounds thinner than me. She's always been slender. And I've talked to her about this and she's lived her, she's 71 years old. People don't go around telling her she's too thin, but she's always been thin. And so if you weren't always thin and now you are, you've changed. And that, I think a lot of times that's why we get these comments. Would you agree, Kenny? I agree fully. And I've seen you from the very beginning, yeah. seven years yeah. ago. Kenny's known now. Me, yeah, send, Kenny's and, known uh, me since 2010. I do miss some of the desserts you used uh, to make. You know, I can still make them for you because if they have chocolate or soy in them, I'm, I'm basically allergic, so I'm happy to always make you a dessert. And I, didn't I make you something for your birthday this year? If not, I'll, we'll catch you up. We'll catch up later. All right, so let's see. Grace has a question. Grace says, that's one of my favorite names, by the way. I always thought if I had a baby girl. I, I, I liked Rachel. I liked Grace. I like those names very much. I know that you say to eat until full, but with exercise, I need to eat more. The problem is I feel like I don't have energy when I only eat until full. Do you have any suggestions on how not to overeat and have enough calories to sustain an active lifestyle? Sure, so a couple of ideas, Grace. One, eat foods of a higher caloric density. And when I say a higher caloric density, I mean instead of eating the foods to the left of the red line, which we eat exclusively in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, you might want to include some of the foods to the right of the red line. Now, certainly not processed foods like flour, sugar, oil, or alcohol, or animal products, but you, you didn't say whether you were overweight or whether you wanted to lose weight, but there's nothing wrong if you have, if you don't have weight problems or, or these aren't a, a trigger foods for you to eat high fat plant foods like nuts and seeds and avocado. These are of a higher caloric density. So if you don't feel full, it could be that you're not, either you're not getting enough calories in that meal or you're not getting enough volume. So unless you're somebody that's had like a sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass, you might just need to eat a more greater volume. But if you're filling up on the most calorically dilute foods first, like fruits and vegetables, you may not have room for the more calorically dense starches like potatoes, rice, and beans. We do in ultimate weight loss for people needing to lose weight, we sequence the meals eating the most calorically dilute foods first. But if you don't need to lose weight or if you're not feeling full, you may not be getting enough calories. So maybe you don't need to sequence your meal. Maybe you don't need vegetables for breakfast. Maybe you need to go right into the starch or maybe you need to eat the starch first or maybe you need to eat it with the vegetables or maybe you need to eat foods of a higher caloric density that are still healthful whole plant fat foods, not oils and animal products or flour and sugar and alcohol, or maybe you need to eat more frequently, but I don't think you should force yourself to overeat just to get enough calories. I think you might need to eat more frequently or eat foods of a higher caloric density so that you feel full soon, okay? Yes. Kenny, what do you think of this? You, is this working for it's you? It's looking good. I mean, it looks a little darker yeah. in, the, in the screen, but right. it's, it's fine. And I assume you guys are hearing me okay without a mic because we are using this whole new, oh, there's Kenny. There's guys. Kenny. So come on. Um, tattooed Vegan, I know you watch this a lot. You're in Baltimore. It was great meeting you at Sharon's conference. Come on, move to L.A. Who's that? That's a really pretty girl that I met at Sharon's conference, and I think oh, she's single. Gosh. I'm trying to hook you up, dude. All right, so Gwen has a question about psyllium, which is actually a husk. She says it's most commonly known as a laxative. Yes, that's if you've ever taken or heard of Metamucil, Metamucil is, is the psyllium husk. And she says that Doctor's it's... Doctor's favorite ingredient. <laughs> get, right? what, do, what do they say? For a BM in the AM, take Metamucil in the PM or something like that. That was an old saying. Maybe it wasn't Metamucil, but it was, maybe it was XLAC. But she's saying that... Um, 
It's often used as a binder in gluten-free breads. And yes, it is. Actually, I in my cookbook on processed, I use it in one of the recipes. I believe it was, uh, I'm not sure which one because I wrote the book about seven years ago, but it is. It's a binder. But now that we have chia seeds, I prefer to use chia seeds as a binder just because they're high in omega-3 fatty acids and uh so I figure why not use something with benefits. She says that she likes to use it as a thickener because it's a good source of fiber. True. But if you're eating the way I suggest, you're not going to have to worry about fiber. You're going to be getting plenty of fiber. She says research shows that taking psyllium is beneficial to many parts of the body, including the heart and the pancreas. I'd love to see the research you're talking about. I, 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 I haven't heard that, but I'd love to see it. Is that something that Dr. Greger talks about on nutritionfacts.org? I haven't heard of that. So she says, what's my opinion about this product? Well, as I said, it is great for it's a great it's great for constipation, but so is a whole food plant based diet, especially the one we eat in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which is pretty much all fiber all the time, all day long. Uh, I do like chia seeds better because of the omega three fatty acids. I don't think it's a problem. I I don't I think if you if you have constipation, then figure out why you have constipation if you're on this diet. When I interviewed Dr. Popper today, she said a lot of people still aren't drinking enough water, even though they're eating enough fiber. But I don't have a problem with it. If you like it, I know you can get it without Metamucil. I mean, all Metamucil is psyllium, but all psyllium is not Metamucil. And I think I've seen it even at Trader Joe's in a, in a, a, a canister. So if you like it, use it. But just make sure you are drinking enough water with it. Because I think even on the label, there's a warning label that, that you could get uh, clogged up if you have too much fiber without any water. That doesn't feel good. Nope. Uh, any other questions before I've got, got about two left? Someone's just saying that af after they lost some weight, they felt like the temperature in the room half is around 70. I think they freeze more. As well, it, you know, th weight. think about it, guys. Fat, fat, fat is a great insulator. It's like a coat. It's like you're wearing a coat. And I lived with a morbidly obese mother, and she was always had a cloth. She was always sweating. And I was always cold because she was always hot. But we vary in what our... Com most comfortable temperature is. I mean, there's people that like Palm Springs and there's people that like cold weather. So there's variations in that. And also I know myself, I'm hypothyroid. I've always been cold. So it's not because I lost 50 pounds. It's because I'm hypothyroid. I'm just always cold. And I'm actually cold right now because we have to keep the air on because we've got three really hot lights. So uh, move to a warmer climate or as my Jewish grandmother would say, where is Sveta? Sveta. That's better. All right. So I apologize if I botch names that I don't know how to say, but Hakan wonders if it's okay to make an SOS free soup out of the greens instead. If you use two to three pounds of greens every day and make a soup, would that achieve a similar goal, you think, as what you're describing? So I encourage people to eat at least two pounds of non-starchy vegetables. It doesn't have to be all grains, but it's really good if you can have at least half or some of them greens a day maybe one pound raw, one pound cooked. I eat double that, so I figure if I can eat four pounds as a slender person, the rest of you guys can eat at least two pounds. And so if you're making the soup, you know, I think it's great because soup is one of the foods, like salad, that has been shown to actually make you feel full on fewer calories because it's the water in there as well. You're actually usually adding water or maybe no sodium vegetable broth. And you eat less at meals when you start your meal with a soup or a salad. So I think that's great. And also depending on where you live, the weather's getting colder now. Even here in Los Angeles, soup is very warm, very comforting. Now, are you talking about a soup that's made out of just vegetables or a soup that's made with vegetables and starch? Not that there's anything wrong with eating vegetables and starch. We want you to do that. But if you're doing it therapeutically, like we suggest in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, where we do what's called VFB, vegetables for breakfast, we do that to set the tone for the day, increase our self-esteem. Jenny's doing breakfast. vegetables for breakfast now. Charles has been doing six it for six years. Then, we want you to times. eat them before your starch. We want we know that 100 calories is not going to fill you up. So when people say, oh, I, I, I had a pound of kale and I ate uh, a quarter of it and I was full, that... I, I don't see how that's possible for 25 calories to make you feel full. But the idea is, is if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're probably not hungry. And if you wait until you're really hungry to eat, and it may not be at seven in the morning, if you're honest, it might be at two in the afternoon, then even vegetables will taste good. So we want you at least, especially if you're overweight and suffer with like food addiction, when I not mean like food addiction, food addiction, like sugar addiction, the greens are what really help turn off the hunger switch and cut the cravings. We want you to eat. The, the vegetables before the starch, and then you eat more 
vegetables with starch or some starch. So I think it's great. If you have something like a Vitamix or a high powered blender, you can be putting in your greens and other things like flavors like onions and garlic and in three minutes you have hot soup. John Pierre, my partner, always says leave some of it chunky because you want to be able to chew because uh, digestion starts in the mouth with chewing. And there's generally a little bit more satiation when you chew than when you drink. But however, a soup that is hot is different than a green smoothie because a green smoothie is sweet and you're going to slug it down. Hot soup, you cannot chug down that way. And when I have clients that are, say, and I have a few of them that are long distance truck drivers that are teachers or that have certain kind of jobs where maybe they can't always get food when they're hungry, I totally recommend hot soups and maybe even with starch in them, keeping it in a big thermos like the clean canteen. Because even on jobs where you can't like eat at work, if you have a clean canteen, it looks just like a water bottle. You can't see through it. They, no job that I know of is going to tell you you can't have a, a, a beverage at your desk. It may be alcohol. So so I think it's great to make a soup. And uh, Bailey's sitting on Kenny's lap. It was Bailey's birthday yesterday. Thanks, everybody, for the good wishes. All right. Sing happy birthday to Bailey. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> Trish says she has a coworker who lost 80 pounds on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. Congratulations to whoever Could that, that is. I don't know, because uh, who, who is Trisha's co-worker? Please come forward. I'm waiting for her. She says, and has kept it off over three years. That's the hard part. And she is always trying to convince her to join, but she is wary because of all her past dietary attempts, because all of her past dietary attempts have resulted in failure. What can I say to convince her that she should join? Okay, so um, nothing. Because the truth is, uh, there's an old saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So I don't want, I'm not here to convince you to join my program. I'd welcome you if you did, but that's not how we operate. We offer on, uh, no questions asked, money back guarantee in the first 30 days. So if that's your concern, you can, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the thing is, is I want to look at your language for a minute because I was a speech major in college at the Cal State University Northridge. Kenny, go Matadors! I graduated in '95. What year did you graduate? '94. How did you graduate before me? If I'm older than you? Uh, because you, um, well. So that means we were going to college at the same time. Maybe we yeah, met fine. sometime. Wow, that's so cool. Well, anyway, uh, so when you say you failed at previous dietary attempts, what does that mean specifically? And if you you're didn't watching, win. type it in because. When I looked up the word failure in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, there was a definition that said unsuccessful in achieving one goal, one's goals. But it also said that to fail was to neglect to do something. And the reason I say this is my guess is that you didn't fail on these diets. I'm guessing that whatever diet style you did, it worked and you lost weight. But where you, and I put air quotes, where you failed was your ability to maintain your weight. And this is where everybody has a problem. And that's why 98% of people that lose weight gain it back. Because I don't know anybody that hasn't lost weight sometime in their life, whether it was easily, like with the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, there's Bailey, where you get to eat saying amazing to amounts Bailey. of food and not feel hungry. You know, the, the dietary style in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which is the exact same diet they teach at the True North Health Center. That's where I learned it in the same dietary style that Dr. McDougall talks about in his book, The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. All diets work, but the diet style that I recommend is really the only one that allows you to eat to satiation. So other programs, you will lose weight. You will lose weight with chemotherapy and taking heroin and doing any kind of a weighing and measuring program where you're eating crap but smaller amounts and weighing and measuring it on a plate. But the problem is, is when you don't eat to satiation, you are doomed to dietary failure because what happens is you get so hungry that you have no choice but to go off the diet. So I don't think you failed. I think the diet failed you. But the other thing I want to point out is the, the other definition for fail is to neglect to do something. Let me ask you a question, Trish. If you were, and again, I skipped fourth grade, so my geography may be off because I'm making this up, but let's say you were driving, and this could be completely wrong, but the analogy hopefully will work. Let's say you were driving from Los Angeles to Miami, Florida in a car, and it would take you however long it would take you, and you would take whatever route you took. And then let's say you ended up in Minneapolis. Maybe, I don't know if that's on the way, but for whatever reason, you ended up in Minneapolis, and you liked Minneapolis, and you stayed there, and you never got to Florida. Did you fail to get to Florida 
or did you just stop going to Florida? You see, if you don't do whatever, whatever diet style you do, and this is like, it, to me, it's a no brainer, but this is where I have a hard time convincing people, whatever you do to lose weight, I want you to not just like, but to love it. Because if you don't and don't continue it, you will gain weight back. It's not a matter of failing. It's a matter of neglecting to do something. In other words, if the diet failed, it's because you weren't doing it anymore. So really the diet didn't fail you. Maybe it did. I mean, because it wasn't a, a, the right diet for, for sustainability, like the weighing and measuring diets and, you know, counting calories, carbs, and points. But instead of beating yourself up saying you failed, no, you didn't fail. You just stopped doing it. That's all. And if you continue to do it, you will have success. Now, there's myriad people, myriad reasons that people relapse, even on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And it's usually some kind of emotional reason that they say is the reason. Like, And again, I'm not minimizing the struggles that people go through when a loved one dies or their mother dies or their dog is sick or they lose their job. But if your environment supported you, it would be very, very unlikely that you would be able to relapse or at least so quickly and easily. There would have to be effort taken. You'd have to leave your house and go out and get this stuff. And then you would have the ability to create what's called a pause and maybe think about whether you want to do it. But the biggest problem is I would say that the diet sites didn't fail you, Trish. I would say that your environment failed you. So the first question I ask you and I ask everyone that has had a relapse or a weight gain is, Where'd you get the food? What does your environment look like? What's so, your pantry look like? Exactly. And in a mastery program, that's one of the assignments. They actually have to shoot videos of their refrigerator and their cabinets and things like that. You know, if I, is Sharon still on? If I go to Sharon McRae's house in Baltimore, which I've done many times, the food is excellent there. I totally recommend you go there if you're in town. I'm sure she'd be happy to have you over. She has a family of five, three teenage kids. They are not overweight, never have been. Nobody in that family is a food addict. They eat the same way. There's no way that any there could be any kind of dietary failure in that house because the environment supports them. So keep in mind that if you, quote, failed, it is because you didn't continue to do it. You know, it's just like in school. You you know, if you get a failing grade, it's usually because you didn't do your homework. I mean, I'm guessing. I'm sure there's certain situations where you could say well, the teacher didn't like you or whatever. But, but do you get what I'm saying, Trish? If you're on and you get that uh, type in, if anybody has any thoughts on what I just said, please comment. Well, we have a question. And I don't think it's on this topic, mm -hmm. but it's on the topic of uh, colored greens. What spices, what type of spices do you recommend to put on mm -hmm. colored greens? So no salt, no pepper. Yeah, um, but what would you, because she has something issue with the GERD and she doesn't want to use it, anything uh -huh. particular. Yeah, well, you know, um, with the gastroesophageal reflux disease, one of the best things you can do is go on this type of diet, an unprocessed diet without processed food like oil, flour, sugar, alcohol, those kind of things. You know, my husband had terrible GERD for seven years, endoscopies, um, proton pump inhibitors, head of the bed uh, being lifted up. And the minute he started eating this way, everything got better. No more medication, no more GERD. That's and, the oil. Yeah, the oil, especially for my husband. And so, so that's number one, what are you eating? But as far as seasonings, you know, they say sometimes people with GI issues, it's the, it's the spicy ones that bother them. So, you know, I love, I mean, collard greens are great because if you blanch them, they can be wraps. You can put yummy things inside like beans and rice. And instead of having a flour or even a corn tortilla, which is hard to roll, they can be your wraps. So that's one way to do it. I, when you cut greens very, very small, like chiffonade cut, they can go into your salads raw. They're delicious. What? Yeah. Chiffonade cut? Chiffonade. What is that? Chiffonade is like... So if this was the collard green, what a chiffonade cut is, is like you roll it like this, oh, okay. and then you go Chop really it. small, or you can use herbs. Like a sushi cut. Thing you know, if the, the, if the Whole Foods okay. by you and Tarzana, they have usually very finely cut kale and finely cut, okay. uh, very often a Swiss chard as well. So, uh, you know, the seasonings that I use, I love Benson's Table Tasty, 10% off with code uh, Chef AJ. Her, this Table Tasty is my favorite one. She has a line of salt-free seasonings. Those of you who went to Vegas got to try the whole line. And all the balsamic vinegars from Be Mon Paz, those things are delicious on greens. Or refer to episode 24 of Weight Loss Wednesday, the vegetable episode where I show you how to make the mm -hmm. smack and mouth-watering kale. And that's a great recipe. It's amazing how you know which episode. Well, it's I only have a few episodes only memorized. 45. Oh, oh, Dr. Gosh. McDougall has an idemic memory. If you ask him a question, he goes, you know, in the, the June 2004 newsletter, I, I only have a few oh of the gosh. episodes memorized. 24, because because it's the vegetable episode uh, 36 is what I eat in a day. I think those are the only two I have memorized. 
Anything else? Before? Well, we have Leslie who has this question, mm -hmm. and she's saying, "I was told that being disciplined is not living or real life, especially no sugar, no oil." And it's like, come on! I was told that no smoking is not real life. I don't know so. what you mean by being disciplined. I mean, um, I mean, first of all, who told you that? And it's uh, you know, it's usually uh, something that does. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that every alcoholic out there would tell you that living a life without alcohol is not living a life. You know, people existed throughout most of human history without processed foods like sugar and or flour. Chocolate. So, um, you know, I mean, I think when you're addicted to something, that's what you always say because you can't imagine what life is like without it. But if you were raised in Dr. Goldhammer's home, like his son Gar, who's never had bread or flour or sugar or chocolate or alcohol, he has a pretty extraordinary life and he's a pretty extraordinary human being who's pretty much never been to the doctor when he's in his 30s and uh, looks really good. By the way, he's single too. He kind of looks like Tom Cruise when he takes his glasses off. Very sweet guy. And he was raised that uh, if he was a good boy, he'd get Brussels sprouts. And guess what his favorite food is? Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. So I don't think it takes discipline to not do something that you don't do. So in other words, like I, I've never taken cocaine or heroin, it doesn't take any discipline for me not to have those things. And I, sugar for me is a non-negotiable, and so it doesn't really take any discipline for me not to eat it because it's poison. I mean, for, when I was addicted to it, sure, it took a lot. I don't know if discipline is the right word. But, uh, you know, again, it's not a court-ordered program. You're free to live your life any way you choose. The problem is, is if you eat like most Americans, you will be fat sick or fat and sick like most Americans. So again, you get to choose. That's the great thing about living in this country. Cool. All right, last question is from Kelsey. Her first line is, I won't lie. Well, good for you. She says, I think I am addicted to That's salt and sugar. As most people are, because they are addictive. They're not found in nature, certainly not any concentrated form. And you know what's interesting before I get onto your question is sugar, we're genetically hardwired to prefer the taste of sugar, fat, and salt for survival. But in nature, they don't exist in concentrated forms, and they never exist together. So in other words, the salt in nature is from greens, from vegetables. The sugar in nature is from fruit, and the fat in nature is from things like nuts and seeds and avocado that for our ancestors were seasonal, were very difficult to access as they were nomadic and very hard to open, not the avocados, but the nuts, for example. And so that's how they exist in nature. But if you notice, they never exist together in nature. You will never be able to come up with a whole natural food that is salt and fat together or salt and sugar together or sugar and fat together. But what is processed food and restaurant food that we love so much? It's sugar, fat, and salt in combinations of two or all three. I mean, think about it. Even if you love French fries and potato chips, I guarantee that if we just fried the potato in oil and did not put salt on, you would go, bleh, you wouldn't like it at all. So you like sugar and fat together you like salt and fat together, and you love sugar, fat, and salt together, like in kettle corn or Cinnabon and things like that. And so maybe not everybody is addicted to sugar, fat, and salt, but everybody prefers them because that we're genetically hardwired to. But again, remember, in nature, they never existed together, and that is how most people are consuming them today. So she says, I've been using it as a coping mechanism since my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Food related was how it happened. And it's true. Every word you say is addictive. So first of all, I'm sorry that your mother's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I would refer you to Dr. McDougall's website because there have been people that have recovered from even stage four using his and these dietary protocols. But if your mother's breast cancer was food related and you are genetically her daughter, not adopted, then you probably have the same genetic makeup, which means you're predisposed. So the last thing you want to do is follow in her footsteps. And that's what you're doing if you're eating the kind of foods that caused her to have breast cancer. So I think you need to find another coping mechanism. I, I don't think you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program because I, I, names that are a little bit unusual, like Kelsey, I would, I would remember, I think. So I would consider that for support to find ways to medicate without using food, like doing many of the other techniques that we teach. And again, medicate might not be the right word. Mitigate is probably a better word for your stress. So whether you do it through the Ultimate Weight Loss Program or working with a private therapist or, or talking to Dr. Doug Lyle, I would recommend you get some help for that. And uh, she says, in my book on process, I mentioned not eating a lot of nuts and seeds, but they are in the recipes. Will I lose 
much weight in 30 days as your challenge suggests? How does weight loss program different and would it be recommended and helpful with PCO? PCOS. So, uh, you know, I was reading a little bit about, this is my book on process, by the way. I wrote it seven years ago. My new book should be coming out very soon. And I was reading up on PCOS on Dr. Furman's Stop website. Me. When you say very soon, people have been asking this question. Well, I mean, I'm praying for December 1st. I don't know. You guys, it's not in my hands anymore. I wrote the book. It's in the hands of the people that are doing what's known as the formatting. It's a very complicated thing with a cover, front cover design, spine design. I I can't tell you. I don't know. I'm praying December 1st. So I wish I knew. There you go. But um, so uh, where, what was I saying? So um, you interrupted and I can't remember. So this is my book on process. And this was written in 2010 while I was still 50 pounds heavier than I am now. It was it, it was published a couple of weeks after going to True North Health and meeting Dr. Alan Goldhammer, Dr. Doug Lyle, who basically explained to me everything I needed to know to become as they say, a skinny bitch. And it's pretty much everything Dr. McDougall has always taught. It's just that I never could afford to go to his program and I had never read his book even though I had it. And it was really helpful to me having them explain it to me like I was a dummy, which I was nutritionally back then. And so it's, it's all the same uh, program basically, or at least the same eating style. But I was looking up PCOS and Dr. Furman's website, and he says it's almost always linked to being overweight. And so if you become not overweight, then it can improve. He was talking about how his wife had it and was told she couldn't have children. She ended up having four children. So the, so, but let me get to the question is, um, so how is it different? So how is Unprocessed different from the Ultimate Weight Loss Program? Well, my book Unprocessed is a memoir and it's the first 52 pages of the story of my life. It's an abbreviated version and you can also see the story of my life on YouTube or Dr. McDougall's website. It's called From Fat Vegan to Skinny Bitch. And so that's, that's what this is. And there's 109 recipes that are gluten-free, sugar-free, flour-free, and definitely free of oil. And they are free of salt, but what I did not know when I wrote this book that you weren't allowed, and when I say you weren't allowed, I mean, you're allowed to do anything you want, but if I was going to be compliant with the way Dr. Goldhammer teaches, I couldn't use even like a teaspoon of low sodium miso, which had 110 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon, or raw coconut aminos, which had 95, uh, milligrams of sodium per teaspoon, which is still better than salt, which is 2,300 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon. But only three of the 109 recipes, I believe, maybe four, have even those small amounts of those products. So over half of the recipes have no added fat, but many of the recipes do call for nuts and seeds. I don't, I think, I don't think there's a lot of avocado in here, maybe two recipes. Now, a lot of the recipes, the nuts and seeds can be taken out omitted completely or substituted. And as soon as my book comes out, Glenn and I are going to not rewrite on process, but do an updated version, a revision where we're going to explain what we have now learned with the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, how you can apply that. So in the meantime, many people have been able to use this book to get to their ideal weight. But there are some people and I didn't know this back then that are like myself, food addicts. I didn't even know what food addiction was back there or understand it. If you are somebody that can eat nuts or seeds or avocados or high fat plant foods in moderation or an ounce a day is recommended and be happy with your body and your weight and not be triggered to overeat because for some people, even though nuts may not be addictive the way that caffeine and chocolate and flour and sugar and alcohol are, because they're so delicious and tantalizing and because they pack so many calories in a small amount, there are some people, especially women, especially women that are overweight, not so much ones that are athletic and not overweight, that can't eat very many of these high fat plant foods, if any, and lose weight or maintain their weight. I didn't know this back then. So there's many people for which this book has been great, like Sharon McRae's kids who need a lot more fat and for people that aren't overweight. But for some of us that are, those recipes will not support ultimate weight loss. Now that said, I would still say that if you are struggling with the ultimate weight loss program, go back to unprocessed. Don't go back to in and out burger. Don't go back to flour and sugar, which we know are addictive. Sugar is more addictive than cocaine and heroin. Go back to these recipes. This could be a lifesaver. We talk about in other, I can't remember if it was other episodes of Weight Loss Wednesday or when I interviewed Doug Lyle about the difference between the ego trap and the pleasure trap. But if somebody is failing, and I hate that word, but you brought it up today, uh, I believe it was Trish, 
if somebody is failing on my program or any program, instead of doing a more restrictive program, do a least restrictive program. It's like how Dr. Lyle talks about in the continuum of evil. If you're eating an F, then it's okay to eat a C. You don't have to go right back to an A. You may never ever have to even do an A. It just depends. And not that um, processed is a B or a C, but what it is, it's richer foods. And they're very satisfying because these recipes were tested on the students at the Braille Institute where I work. The disappearing lasagna on page 100, I mean, that is a kick-ass recipe. I have served that at <laughs> conferences, bless you, Kenny, to 200 medical doctors that weren't even vegan. I've done this several times. So these are richer recipes because they have higher fat. They're very satisfying. So if you can't do vegetables for breakfast, if you can't do ultimate weight loss, don't go start weighing and measuring crap food on a plate. Go back to a book like Unprocessed and make some of these richer recipes. You may not lose weight and you may not lose weight as quickly, but you will gain health and you will gain sanity from getting off that dietary mindset and roller coaster. The recipes that have the most fat in them are the dessert recipes, but think about it. I was a pastry chef for many years. And what is a pastry? It's sugar, flour, and oil. Well, I didn't use sugar and I didn't use flour. So therefore, what I did use was nuts because when you grind nuts like almond flour, you can use nuts in the same way you would use flour. And you can use dried fruit like dates or other dried fruits the same way you would use sugar. So these are calorically dense. The desserts, they're 40 dessert recipes. That's where all the fat is in a process, not in the entrees. In the lasagna, there's a cup of pine nuts, which you can completely omit. It's fine. And it comes to two teaspoons of nuts, I believe, no, excuse me, four teaspoons of nuts per serving if you do use it. So the thing is, again, good, better, best. And if eating a piece of my Chocolate peanut butter cheesecake is going to save you from eating a Cinnabon, which is probably five times the calories and has saturated fat. Then I think this is a good thing. The other thing is, is even though some of my recipes in unprocessed are high fat and have more, uh, have a greater caloric density. The thing is, is they're actual food. It, my recipes contain food, whole food found from a plant. And so you will feel more satisfied with smaller amounts than if you're eating sugar and flour. Not so process chemicals. Of Exactly. Like uh, Cinnabon. Uh, oh, there was one more question. I, I'm sorry, I forgot where to go. Oh, it was from Kelsey. Where did I put it? Yikes, Kenny. Is it still at the computer? Oh, yikes. Hold on. Kenny, can you talk to the people for a minute? I forgot one more question. So people asked the question of PCOS, and that was mentioned earlier by Sharon McCray, which is said PCOS is. Oh, man. Sure, polycystic ovary syndrome. Mm -hmm. This is so what we look like right together. Now. See how good looking he is? I'll go back Phew, to I almost page. forgot the question. So, um, oh, so that's that's the answer. The other difference is, is the unprocessed 30 day challenge no longer exists. It exists as a DVD, which has been off the market for a while. We may bring it back. And it was the program we ran before. So that ship has sailed. We don't run that anymore. The Ultimate Weight Loss Program, the comprehensive word there is a program where you get ongoing support from a whole tribe of like-minded people that are loving and supportive and many have had tremendous success taking off 100 to 300 pounds, keeping it off for over five years now for many of them. And it's, it's a program. So it's not just a book or a diet and it's more than 30 days because it, it, that's, the, that's like back to Trisha's question. If you only do it for 30 days, what are you going to do with day 31 if you go back to what you're doing? Don't be surprised if you gain weight back. You're not a burger, right? So this not. is, um, here's, is this another, uh, is this the same question? Oh, this is another PCOS question, or was that the same one? Um, okay, this, no, it's a different one. So a lot of PCOS today. Uh, this is from, oh, this is the same question. That was Kelsey's question. I apologize if this was just the longer page. So that's all I got for you guys today. If you have any more questions, please submit them through my website, www.eatonprocess.com. Click on that little blue box. Why not be on my mailing list so you can get notified sooner about where I am and where I'll be. If you live in Los Angeles and are not following the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I'm teaching an all-dessert master pastry class at the new cooking school that I've been teaching at called Boulevard Kitchen in Sherman Oaks on Thursday, October 26th. I'd love to have you join me. You should come to that one, Kenny. I'll ask if you can be my sous chef. Anything else before I bid adieu to these lovely people? I We're missed you guys. Thank yous. Absolutely. Uh, thank yous. So thank you guys so much for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ, and I truly believe you can have both the health and the body you so richly deserve if you will only eat your damn broccoli. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.
Okay. Bailey, no part.